Welcome to episode 8 of What Matters. This is Stephen Brantley. In this episode, I sit down with Dr. Jessica Satcher and Yan Zeng, and they are the co-founders of the Phage Directory. The Phage Directory is an organization that promotes further research and use of phage therapy, which is a method of combating bacterial infection. So we talk about the growing trend of antibiotic resistance in bacteria and how much of a problem that's really becoming and a little bit of the history of phage therapy and what exactly the phage directory does to promote research and use. So I think it makes for a very interesting conversation. I'd like to thank Dan Evans, who I interviewed in episode four, for connecting me with the phage directory for this interview. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms. We're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes podcasts, all the big ones. So subscribe there, leave a review, and be sure to follow on social media. We're on Facebook at What Matters with Stephen Brantley. And you can follow me on Twitter at JS underscore Brantley. I hope you enjoyed this episode of What Matters. This is the donation portion of the podcast. If you've heard it before, feel free to skip ahead. If you haven't, I'll be sure to keep it short and sweet. Basically, it costs money and a good bit of time to produce this podcast. I really enjoy doing it, and I'll keep it up as long as I can. Uh, but a good bit of cost goes into it. I pay monthly fees for um, podcast hosting, and I also do a good bit of research uh, for each of my guests, uh, which usually involves buying a book. I keep an Audible um, subscription. Um, so any support that you guys may provide would be much appreciated. You can find a donation link on uh, whatmatters.libsyn.com. That's whatmatters.libsyn.com. And you can either just send a one-time donation or set up a monthly donation of a few dollars. And if you in any way can't uh, financially support it, if, if in any way it'll be a strain on you, then please don't feel like you need to do it. And uh, you can definitely support the podcast in other ways, and that could be um, by sharing the podcast on social media and um, talking to your friends and family about it. And any support at all that you can provide is much appreciated. And if for some reason you don't want to um, donate via PayPal, then just let me know, and we can definitely work something else out. And when you go to the website, there is a donation button in the top right-hand uh, corner of the page. And I will also include a donation link in podcast descriptions. And I'm asking for donations because I'll never have advertisements on here. I believe that a lot of the problems that we see in media today are rooted in the advertisement model. So I'm going to do this simply on a listener support basis. So I want to thank you for your support, and I hope you enjoy this episode of What Matters. All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having us. I'm here with uh, Jessica Satcher and uh, Yan Zhang. Get the names right? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right, so tell me, uh, first of all, a little bit about yourselves. Um yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Uh, okay, so I just finished graduate school. I did my PhD in microbiology mm -hmm. from University of Alberta in Canada, and I was studying phages, bacteria phages, that target Campylobacter. And so I finished that last summer, and uh, Jan and I started Phage Directory a little bit before I finished there. So um, from there, that's where I am. <laughs> Cool. And my background is in uh, UX design and um, computer science. So I have a background in computer science and I did a lot of psychology in my undergrad days. And after undergrad, I went into a master's program in human-computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon. And that's where we studied, you know, how do people use computers, how do people work with computers, and how can you develop software and apps that better uh, better fit, fit people's needs and how they behave. And so I, out of that master's, I moved to Atlanta, and I worked for a few design agencies, like Moxie, for example, where 
We built a lot of websites and campaigns for Coca-Cola, Verizon, L'Oreal, and so on. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. And then after getting out of the agency world in 2016, I worked for a small company called Ubiquity. Well, they're not a small company. They're a Silicon Valley company. And at Ubiquity, we try to build a community project. Um, so basically, we had it was a fairly small tech company, but they had this problem with um, they had a very large community that wanted support and wanted to help each other with putting these Wi-Fi devices up around their neighborhoods. So Ubiquity makes wireless equipment, like kind of like your Netgear routers, but these are like Netgear routers at um, at high speeds, right? So therefore, connecting small towns together and therefore giving smaller remote communities Wi-Fi access and a cable or um, optical fiber-like speeds. And so a lot of this is, a lot of the products you buy and you figure out yourself, but they are they can be pretty complicated to set up. So uh, they essentially set up this like online forum and community to uh, for the Ubiquity support team to help others out, but for other members to also help each other out. So that's what I was working on to try to improve that community side. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, I come from a small town and we struggle to get good internet. <laughs> <laughs> that's an awesome um, mission. Okay, so you guys, I have you on here today to talk about uh, phage um, therapy, um, antibiotic uh, resistance, and the phase directory. So you guys co-founded the phase directory. Uh, yeah. What is that? Um, so it's an online platform to connect people in the phage community. So that includes scientists who study phages in their labs. It's mostly microbiologists um, because phages are viruses. And uh, so not just scientists, but there are now clinicians like doctors and other uh, medical professionals that want to get into um, working with phages in a medical capacity, so using phages to treat bacterial infections, because phages uh, target bacteria. Um, that's what they do in nature. They're the natural predators. So all kind of bacteria have phages that kill them, and it's like a, an arms race that's going on. So there is um, you can use phages for human therapy, for all sorts of things. And so the community of people studying or working with phages is starting to grow. Um, so we have scientists, as I said, medical professionals, but also um, there's biotech companies and some pharma companies are interested now to start getting into commercializing these things. So we are trying to connect all of these people and their information, allow them to do a better job of uh, communicating, like for instance, researchers might not know that um, clinicians are ready for this um, and clinicians don't know where to get phages if they want to try phage therapy, which is an experimental treatment right now. It's not FDA approved yet. So people who want to get it FDA approved, like um, companies that are commercializing phages, they need to do these clinical trials. They need access to scientists who know how to work with these things. And um, it's a little bit tricky. It's different than regular antibiotics. So we just noticed that there's this large need for um, a platform that can connect all these people and, and all the things that they know, all their insights. And the way science publishing works right now, it's, it's kind of academics publish, other academics read those publications. It's hard to access. And everybody else is kind of hooped, basically. So, yeah, that's what we're... Yeah, well, well, you're definitely in a good place in Atlanta um, for, for that. Uh, what, what, what brought you guys to Atlanta? Was it? Good question. Um, my PhD supervisor moved our lab down to Georgia partway through my PhD. So um, she said, does anybody want to move to Georgia? And we were in Edmonton, Alberta, which is not the same climate. No, no, <laughs> and so I think all of us raised our hands and we're like, sure, why not? Because we're all kind of in our 20s, like, why not go on an adventure for a couple of years? So we packed up and moved the lab, and that was in 2016. So I ended up in Athens at UGA, and um, I was still a University of Alberta student. Ended up just being a visiting scientist in her lab, officially. Um, and then I met Jan because he was living in Atlanta. We met through swing dancing. <laughs> so how'd you end up? Well, I just, well, it was either, uh, I <laughs> 
Well, we, we had a conference here while I was in my master's program, and I met a few really cool people that eventually recruited me to work with Moxie. But it was either coming to Atlanta or going to Silicon Valley, like pretty much all of my friends did, right? They all work at Google, Facebook, and all these other big companies. But for me, I just didn't really want that super crazy expensive you know like I didn't want to be part of that mess I instead wanted to pay off like all the student debt and everything and just gather like a good amount of savings and you know kind of reflect on life which is why I chose Atlanta instead of the valley and then I just stayed I mean I've been here for almost nine years now and it's it's really nice here yeah, yeah. Um, so the two of you are in Atlanta, but um, you work with labs all across the world, right? Right, yeah. Um, we're seeing phage directory as a global platform, and so we're not seeing borders. Uh, the only borders that we need to be aware of are because some of what we're doing it very much depends where people are, the kind of um, the kind of things that they need. Like, for instance, if somebody wants to do phage therapy in the U.S., there's certain like uh, things that we can tell them that will be helpful that wouldn't apply to someone in another country. So we are really um, seeking to help people all over, but the way that we help them ends up being kind of tailored to where they're from. Yeah, got you. And uh, is Phage Directory is, is your ultimate goal? To, do you want to make it a nonprofit or? Also, a good question because <laughs> people ask us this a lot, and people often just call us a nonprofit and. Because it's very mission driven what we're doing, so I mm-hmm. think people just equate nonprofit with mission driven. But we're learning a lot more. Well, I'm I'm learning about this as we go. That there's a lot of kind of middle ground um, between nonprofit and for profit. There's like public benefit kind of companies that are for profit that are um, very mission driven too. So mm-hmm. we haven't made a decision on whether we're going to be a nonprofit or a for profit yet because we haven't incorporated. Do you want yeah. to speak to that? Yeah, so we, we actually got our start um, with the help of the NSF i program, and it's a business accelerator that's trying to uh, convert scientists to business people, right? And they take you through this process called a lean startup, which encourages you to get out of, quote, get out of the building and figure out what people need. So we're currently in that exploratory stage where we're looking at every single possibility and depending on what possibility fits us the best, we'll go with that. So we're not completely discounting going the for-profit route or the B Corp or public benefit route or the nonprofit route. So, so we're still talking to a lot of people and there's still, um, for example, foundations like Gates Foundation or HHMI that we haven't talked to yet that, that we want or that we're planning on talking to soon and maybe these conversations will guide us in the right direction right. yeah people gave us advice um pretty early on we talked to other companies doing similar kind of um online but in the health sector you know things and science sector um and they said figure out like where your revenue stream is going to come from and that's what should dictate whether you're non-profit or for-profit yeah. So we kind of laid off making that decision for yeah. a while. And there, there, good. there are definitely limitations, you know, pros and cons to yeah. each choice. Um, yeah. Nonprofit, you'd be limited probably on some of your lobbying um, capabilities, which that, that could be beneficial in um, this field, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So I want to dive more in depth into um, what phage therapy is. Um, how long has uh, phage uh, research been going on? Yeah, a um, hundred years, um, give or take a few now. So um, that's the kind of crazy part about phage is that phage therapy is this, quote, new and experimental emerging kind of treatment, but it's one of the oldest. So it's got this two-sided paradox, but um, people have been researching phages all through in that time, but they haven't taken off therapeutically in the Western world um, and this wasn't the case back in the early days. They did, like Eli Lilly here was, was working with phage therapy and everything. And, um, and in, but yeah, anyway, to take it back, the, in Eastern Europe, that's where phage therapy really was going strong. And this is before antibiotics were discovered. And antibiotics 
um, being discovered kind of is touted as the reason why phage therapy has been pretty much abandoned in the West because antibiotics work so well and they have until now we're starting to realize they're not working so well, but we didn't know that for the, um, for well, we're finally making that realization and actually doing something about it. So that's why phage therapy is suddenly this quote new technology, but it's yeah. not new to the whole world. Yeah. And I guess science has progressed so much since they first used phage therapy, right? Like they started using it in the twenties and thirties during the first world war. Medics would carry these kits with phages on them to treat people. So it's not a new thing at all. But but just remember that like they were treating people with phages before we knew what genetics was. Like we have had a huge revolution in science since then, and now we actually have the tools to figure out what makes phages work. Yeah, and that's really key because the reason phages were kind of abandoned in favor of antibiotics is partly because it's so much easier to work with antibiotics. You don't need to really know what you're treating you, because they're so broad spectrum, but phages are very narrow spectrum, so um, you need to know what kind of species you have. And before you have the, the techniques that can tell you that really reliably and easily in a medical setting, um, how are you going to guess right very often? And so that you can imagine how that would have gone where you're trying phages and they sometimes work and they sometimes don't. And then antibiotics work almost all the time. And of course, you're going to go with that. And so now we're learning we need narrow spectrum drugs, but we have this amazing repertoire of them, the reservoir of them in the world, in the soil and in the ocean and any kind of bacteria you have. If you put your mind to it and put some time into it, um, you could probably find phages against it. And that's pretty much true for the the bacteria that have been studied to date. So, um, yeah, all that to say, we now, now that we have genetic tools, we can know, you know, which bacteria do we have, we can look at which phage is likely going to work on it, and it's a totally different ballgame now that we have more information. Yeah, yeah back, back around when it started, was it was it somewhere around um, 1915? Yeah. Time? yeah, yeah. 17, um, that, that was prior to, I think, the use of really uh, double blind experiments and right you know, yeah so exactly it was hard to actually do it's good research so hard to imagine how to like <laughs> research is hard today <laughs> um yeah. and i can't imagine what it would have been like just knowing so much less about the things we know now mm-hmm. like dna wasn't discovered like for decades after like how could you even conceptualize that there would be these viruses that inject their dna like you it's just amazing that they went forward with these ideas, and yeah. and Felix Sorel was really the pioneer that found that they work. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Did um did political ideology, nationalism, did, did that ever kind of play into kind of hindering the um, further research? Because the yeah. Soviet Union really yeah. kind of pioneered this yeah. research, and the West kind of just stayed away from it. Yeah. Yeah. There's. I mean, I'm. There's much better people to speak to this than me, but. Um, it's, it's pretty much in the intro of every phage review paper out there nowadays, and people get into it to different degrees, but, um, there's been a lot written on just, like, all the political stuff that was going on, and, like, Stalin was, like, really in favor of making a phage therapy center, and, um, George Eliava, who started this Eliava center in Tbilisi, Georgia, not yeah, Georgia here, yeah, the only... <laughs> Yeah, only in the phage world do you have to specify which Georgia you mean, <laughs> it seems. Um, but anyway, the so they have this amazing institute where they've been treating people with phages routinely since the beginning. And that's still, um, it, like, it's still there today. And we know people from there and they're, they come to phage conferences and present their positive and sometimes negative phage results. And, um, but, but yeah, politically it would have been so interesting to be a fly on the wall mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and Felix Durrell who was I mean well considered French Canadian he was like over there with George Eliava and their buddies and they're gonna make this phage therapy center and then um bad things happened and George Eliava was I think executed by the 
apparently he's fallen no and this is just i don't know i've read this somewhere but apparently he fell in love with someone like in oh Stalin's the secret bl- police yeah and the secret police has like the the like, um head of the him. police the head of his, the chief of police's wife oh yeah. he fell in love with him and then he had him executed i think yeah there was some, yeah wow. So, multiple layers. And then I know that there's also been a stigma since then that phage was like commie science. Yeah, right. (laughs) And so um, that really, yeah, it's important. And what actually helped phage therapy continue was, you know, like they they thought, the Russians thought that antibiotics were Western science, right? And Mm -hmm. they wanted to stick it to the Westerners. And because they had this other tool that the Westerners weren't using, but they actually helped preserve phage therapy. And a lot of the tools they're using now, a lot of the phages they're using now, are actually carried over from the research back then. Yeah, they're still using, at the LA Ava Center, they're still using the cocktails of phages that Felix Durrell, who discovered them in like 1915, was using. Like those recipes have not yeah. changed that much, is my understanding. And they still work great. <laughs> it is. Are they, um, you know, Georgia and for the former Soviet Union countries? Uh, are they um, a lot further along in this research um, than the West right now? Um, well, I think there's like there's so much that they must know from all mm-hmm. of this experience, and um, not all of their research is in English, and not all of it is published in the same way that the West mm-hmm. tends to think is the right way um so there's been some there's definitely some sentiments over here that it can't be trusted sometimes the the work that's been done that they don't do their clinical trials the way the fda would have them done and so um whether that's true like i think we should be learning from what they've done and i bet they have a wealth of information but yeah but yeah there's certainly a stigma against it yeah if anything we should try to make all that information available and maybe that can inform clinical trials here. So we can do clinical trials and do quote unquote Western science uh, in a way that like incorpor- incorporates what they learned. Yeah, like things like how do you put the phage into the patient? Like how like does it interact with the bandage? You know, if you put it on on a wound, like it, does the bandage mess up the phage in some way, or does it? Can you put it in a gel or a cream or like? Are are they stable to store for long periods? Like all the little things that you wouldn't think matter. Um, all this experience working with them in a medical setting is yeah. super valuable. And we are just getting to the point where we're doing those kind of studies now. We being the, the West, like, I mean, I right. don't speak for them all, but <laughs> there's um, a huge uptick in the number of biotech companies focusing on phages lately that we've been noticing. And that I just got back from a conference this week where there there was a lot of talk about formulation and it's exciting to see the talks like that because it used to be so like only in the lab like we study whether the phage actually kills the organism and and now I'm seeing the talks where it's like how should we exactly formulate this into a tube like that's so cool because it means it's getting closer you know so we we went into the you know the 40s or so and that's when um, antibiotics really started taking off. Am I right? Is that when it really? Yeah, they're discovered in 28. 28. But at, at, so it was a World War II kind of, right. that was the need that drove it up. And then the antibiotic um, resistance of you know, bacteria starts kicking in soon after that. And then, um, yeah. and then, you know, now people are starting to look back into phage therapy. But what... How big of a problem is antibiotic resistance? Yeah, uh, well, the, the the estimate that everybody kind of throws around um, everywhere lately is that by 2050, we'll see 10 million deaths a year worldwide from antibiotic resistance. So 10 million, and um, cancer is predicted to be around 8 million, or maybe that it's 8 million now. Um, 8 million a year that die from cancer and so surpassing the death rate of cancer by 2050 which is a really big difference from right now it's 700,000 deaths globally per year from antibiotic resistance that's the estimate from this kind of antibiotic resistance report that the UK government I believe commissioned Mm -hmm. and it's called the O'Neill report Um, it's been what people seem to be using as like the best estimate, most recent estimate we have. So, um, so yeah, seven hundred thousand to ten million um, in just a couple of decades. So that's 
it's ramping up, but it's already pretty bad. And the other thing is in the United States, they the CDC estimate was around 23,000 deaths a year. And then um, some people redid some kind of study where they, they really tried to account for um, some data that wasn't accounted for in that estimate, and they their estimate is 150,000 a year. So, like, it could be, it's probably underestimated the numbers that we have right now. And, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're not reporting exactly what somebody dies from, it's exactly the same way, and, you know, what counts as, if you're reporting they died of a heart attack, but they died because of the infection, like, I'm not clear yet on exactly how reporting ends up being done, but um, my understanding is like it's not perfectly standardized there, so these estimates could be worse than we they are, but they're already bad. So you explained that they're um, kind of the a, a easy way to think about the difference between phage therapy and um, antibiotics is uh, antibiotics is kind of a general, just wipes out everything yeah. that you introduce it to, and, and phage is very um, directed, usually on a particular species of bacteria. Um, what what other differences are there um, in the therapies? What what are some of the downsides behind antibiotics other than the fact that they that uh, bacteria evolve so quickly? Yeah, well, I would say the evolving so quickly part is one of the things in common between antibiotics and phages. There's still going to be evolution of resistance against phages. Um, The cool thing is that phages evolve back, so they can evolve faster than bacteria. And antibiotics can't evolve. They're a very tiny molecule that is um, inert, basically. It will have an effect based on something that it interacts with in the bacterium. But phages are actually propagating themselves inside the bacterium and they have genetic material and antibiotics don't. And so phages are expressing their genes and they're like going through their protocol on how to kill the, the organism. And every, every time you have a population of them, they're all a little bit different and they're all going to kill, you know, the bacteria in a slightly different way maybe. And, um, so you get a lot of evolution that can happen because they can, uh, Sometimes, you know, even if there's a resistant organism popping up, some of that population of phages might be able to take that one on. All these little genetic tweaks happening piece by piece on both sides, so it's really cool. And uh, another big difference, just the size, um, the antibiotics are really tiny compared to phages. Phages are huge. And we just heard this, I heard this quote, I hope I get it right. Um, from the conference I was at this week that was saying that if we tried to give, so if you think of a person who's getting penicillin and the number of penicillins, like the number of individual molecules that you're giving to that person, if we tried to give that many phages to a person, that would weigh more, the phages would weigh more than the person. So they're way bigger, they're heavier. Um, you just can't obviously get to the kind of dose that you would with penicillin, for instance. Um, but the good thing is that they, they multiply, so you don't have to give them as many. So that's a really neat thing, too. Um, it makes it really hard for traditional pharmacology or pharmacologists and pharmacists who study uh, what happens to a drug in the body. And there's things called pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And, um, and like knowing like how, to, how to dose somebody... You have to pay attention to, you know, what's the half-life and where, where does this go once you inject it? Does it go to the liver and what happens? And for phages, they, it's, you can't treat dosing the same way. That's a big, like, distinguishing factor. And it's really stumping people who are traditionally making traditional drugs and they know how to do that. In your clinical trials, you know, you test um, different doses. But with phages, you're going to be giving a relatively small amount, but it's going to travel to the site of infection and then multiply and then get more numerous in that local area, but not not maybe like if you're just testing the blood, you might not see that because it's only happening maybe in part of the arm that's wounded, you know? So it's very different when you think about it as a, like, as a drug. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a living thing, essentially, although that's debated whether it's li- right, alive. Right, yeah, the virus. It's mm-hmm. much more living than a penicillin. <laughs> right, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so what are the major limitations to further research in this area? Um, to further research, a big limitation is funding. There are all these negative biases that exist 
um, still. So like in the 30s, the Journal of the American Medical Association, I guess, put out a paper that said phages had been tried and they don't work. So we're done. And this was taken seriously and they really did fall out of favor around then. And of course, that's when antibiotics took off. So it's not only the phages fault, mm-hmm. but it was a, a, an iconic point where it was said. And I'm sure um, they'll be saying it causes autism. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, there's there's still a lot of people who remember, I mean, it's, it's not that far in the past that there's, there's, there, there's still a negative stigma now. That mm-hmm. it's just, we tried it and it doesn't work. If it, if it was going to work, wouldn't it have worked by now? We've known about them for so long. So that kind of thinking, um, that's a hurdle, I would say, for people... Um, Maybe not getting into it, but also getting funding when you write your grant proposal saying, I'm going to use phages. Um, Some people have told us that they get rejections that are as simple as like phages have been tried and they don't work. Like, so that's clearly, you know, not evaluating the um, details of the application necessarily sounds like. So people are, are, if with more funding, there could be a lot more work done. So that's that. To answer your question yeah, on what yeah. the hurdles are. Based off of um, research off of the you know, status quo in America, um, what, what does the majority, does the large majority of the research done on it, um, which is limited of course, does it reflect that um, phage therapy is effective? Do you have studies that show that it's you know, not that effective? And is that, that, that could potentially be a problem, you know, of where we we have our trend, our traditions, and you know, setting p values at a certain level, mm-hmm. and all that. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, for the most part, I mean, you, I guess you have to take everything with a grain of salt because publishing right now, you only pretty much publish positive data, mm-hmm. and so um, there's a lot of positive data showing <laughs> that phages work, yeah. and there's a lot of data showing that they don't cause adverse reactions in animals and there's been phase one clinical trials where they just have been tested against humans and they for the tests that have been done um, and there's many case reports thousands from Europe um, that show you know no adverse reactions so the consensus at this point is that phages are safe um, and that they work if you have the right uh, bacterial target. So you have to match them properly. And also when I say work, that means often that they work in a lab and it means, or maybe it means they work in an animal, um, like a mouse, but it, as far as being able to say that they work in humans, that is not something we can really say. There's been one phase two trial that was considered successful there's only been three that have really been tried, and two of them were not designed properly. That's kind of the consensus we're picking up on as we talk to people around. And But the one that worked, where they actually, they did show that with ear infections, pseudomonas, you could use phages, and they worked. So it was a small-scale study, and it wasn't followed up on. Happened at the, kind of near the recession, 2008, and just a matter of companies going out of business and that kind of thing. But... So I'd say there's a lot of hope that they work. There's a lot of case reports showing that they work, but you can't really say they work unless you do this control, controlled clinical trial. Right. So, yeah. Is there, um, is there any way to control, as this research progresses, um, to control the way that, it's, um, that phage therapy is used in the commercial world? Um, to avoid some of the problems that we're seeing in other pharmaceutical areas, like maybe um, holding patents for very long periods of time. Yeah. um, And is that that beyond the scope of what you guys... Well, I've been reading a little bit into um, what you mentioned with patents and things and on ways to incentivize phage development like um, by companies and commercialization. There's a lot of, this isn't phage specific, this is, uh, most of what I read about this is related to antibiotics in general, um, or antimicrobials as a group, which would involve phages, include phages, Um, but the world is starting to realize that antibiotic resistance is an issue, so there's a lot of new incentives coming up that are trying to either um, pay companies um, up front to develop drugs that, that target bacteria, 
Um, or there's talk about, so those would be considered push incentives, and there's talk about pull incentives that are kind of more of like a dangling carrot at the end. So instead of paying up front, you say, okay, if you make a drug and you get it all the way through trials and it gets approved, then we'll give you this money mm -hmm. or you will get some other kind of benefit like cre credits that you can sell to another company. Um, like, and those credits are kind of interesting. They can uh, extend the life of a patent. So say if you're a small company that gets to the end and, and develops an antimicrobial and you, I mean, you're small, so you don't have a lot of money, you get this credit at the end. You don't really care to extend your patent necessarily maybe, but like something like some big pharma company like Merck or whatever might want to extend, like the amount of money they'll make to extend one of their patents a year would be huge. So you get into this like bid where you can sell to the highest bidder as the small company that got all the way there. So I think it's really cool to explore these incentive um, options. And that's like in, there's this new organization, CARBEX, it's an acronym for combating antibiotic resistance of some sort. And um, US government, UK government, now the German government's involved. And there's also a bunch of um, private organizations that are part of it. So it's this like public-private partnership to fund strategies against antibiotic resistance. And there, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff you can read if you want to nerd out about like that kind of, you know, drug incentives and policy, yeah. which I had never I'm, really gotten I'm, into. But yeah, maybe that's... I'm a policy house. guy. And yeah, so, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. I, I was really looking forward to this podcast because it all the the previous episodes have mainly been focused on politics or philosophy, okay. so it'd be nice. It's nice kind of getting into hard science, but of course, you see me bringing up the history of the Soviet yeah. Union and <laughs> the policy and all that. But um, yeah, yeah. But speaking of policy, so they're they're, I feel like they're making more strides in Europe than they're here because mm -hmm. of Belgium has really spearheaded oh, yeah. this new paradigm of passing phages through to treatment. Yeah, it's called the Magistral Phage um, Framework. And so they published it, and you can find it. It's called the Magistral Phage. That's the journal article's name. And it's um, published open access in viruses. And um, it's really cool and lays it all out. But essentially, instead of the traditional taking a phage through all three stages of clinical trials, which can, I mean, cost billions, like um, it gets insane and it takes, you know, it can take over a decade, right? Um, instead, they are certifying phages as safe if they're produced in a certain way. So they have a document that says, this is how you have to produce the phage. And this is what you have to check, you know, how many phages per milliliter is there and how much endotoxin, which is one of the, one of the things people are afraid of using phages because endotoxin is released when bacteria break apart and that's what phages do so when you purify a bunch of phages you got a lot of endotoxin released mm -hmm. from all the dead bacteria and that is something that stimulates the immune system which uh, at high doses is toxic so mm -hmm. you can you have this document that they put together that says all the ways that you need to make the phage and then if you make it to that specification and you get it certified by this third party um, then a pharmacist can take that a compounding pharmacist is what we have in the U.S. Um, they don't call them that there. But uh, essentially, a pharmacist that is able to kind of mix and match medications depending on the patient according to the physician's prescription. So the doctor would prescribe, in theory, that this patient should have a phage. And they would say, you know, a Klebsiella phage for this Klebsiella infection. And then the pharmacist would be able to take that phage off the shelf because it's already been... Um, made to this specification and then put it into, say, some kind of cream and give it to the patient, put it on their wound, whatever it may be. So that's really cool because it's kind of um, putting phages into the hands of pharmacists and the doctors, and it's trying to say, let's make them as safe as possible. And um, there's some criticism of this idea because some people think, you know, you should be going through the rigorous clinical trials. And I'm told that this magistral phage framework does not mean that they're not necessarily going to do clinical trials also, but it's like this alternate channel for phage, for people in need, that, and it's always up to the doctor. So it's really cool to see that just happened last year. So um, it's all kind of fresh news in the phage community. 
and people are buzzing about it a lot. It's mentioned every conference we go to as like, oh, are we gonna are people gonna do what Belgium's doing? And in Europe, because of the European Union, of course, like there's a lot of looking to other countries and being like, okay, let's adopt this aspect of that. So I guess um, I think Netherlands, UK, Germany, France are all kind of moving towards using the Belgian framework. Okay. Yeah. What uh, so beyond I guess general public awareness and um, raising money for research, what what else is needed? What what's the most important thing other than that to uh, further this research in the states? Yeah. Um, so for the clinical trials to happen. Yeah, we, we do need not just money to come in up out of the blue, you know. It needs to be matched with the right people to take these phages forward through clinical trials properly. So um, biotech companies are already in the space. There's a few in the U.S. that are working on this. They're applying for funding, for instance, from Carbex that I talked about earlier, and um, U.S. government like NIH, Nat- National Institutes of Health. Um, they... These companies, like funding those companies to do um, well thought out clinical trials, which is starting to be in the works, that is going to be like, that is really the holy grail. We need the clinical trials to be done. And even one, um, even if one were done, that was an efficacy trial. So phase two showing control and you have to compare phages against the standard of care and show that it's better. You can combine phages with antibiotics and compare that to antibiotics alone and show that it is better. And um, yeah, so honestly, that's the, that's the big thing that we need. And public awareness, there's not a lot of that, and there's not a lot of um, physicians that are aware of it. But I mean, that would all follow once they were approved. Right. There's talk that we should be making the public aware before so that the government will actually start funding these trials. So I think awareness helps there yeah and i think what would really help is getting organizations like the cystic fibrosis foundation on board because phages work really well for certain targeted communities like cf and and right now phages are used as a last line of defense because they aren't approved by the fda but where they actually excel is to prevent patients from getting there in the first place so a phage to be for, for a patient to use these phages, it could increase their quality of life substantially. And so we need organizations like the CF Foundation to champion this as a better way of treating people rather than what's currently available. I, I noticed that when doing research or that came to mind is maybe a kind of a, a downside is that it's primarily you know treated as a last mm-hmm. resort right. method. So... Um, that's not just because it tr- doesn't, maybe, let's just assume maybe it doesn't treat last resort, um, you know, or, or antibiotic resistance. Well, um, that still doesn't mean it's a bad form mm-hmm. of therapy. Mm-hmm. So we do need to see research in the earlier stages of mm-hmm. Yeah, infection. and, and it's, it's so interesting to, to consider uh, experimental phage therapy and compassionate use therapy that's kind of used interchangeably. But... Um, and watch what's happening in that area because a lot of doctors are starting to uh, know about phages and want to use them for their patients now. And right now in the U.S., the FDA has a track for that. So you can apply to get an emergency approval to treat a patient. And that's on the doctors, you know, their, it's, it's what they think is best and they just have to make that case to the FDA. But it's a phone call and apparently like 99% are approved. Wow. So there is a channel and the FDA knows all about phages now. They're doing in-house phage research and they give talks at the phage conferences that um, keep surprising people. They surprised me for sure uh, <laughs> when I first started hearing this. But like FDA is trying to understand phages and we want you to approach us with your ideas on what you want to, what kind of trials you want to set up. And, um, and they're not it used to be said a lot among researchers in the phage community that like FDA will never let this through. And that's not true. And so, um, but with the compassionate use, uh, it's something we've talked about a lot about whether or not to make the public more aware that this channel exists, because 
it's not what it's meant for. You're not meant to use this emergency channel to, you know, use that all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if people are in a position where there's nothing else, I think that they should know that this exists, you know? So Mm -hmm. right now, because it is going to take years before phages are approved and they're on the market, there's actually a chance that people can get that now. So. Such an interesting dilemma. The, the question of how political do we make this? Like how, how much do we try to get politicians involved? Cause that can come with, you know, upsides and downsides. Do y'all have a strategy in navigating the political element? Well, we, there we go again, making it political. <laughs> well, so. well, so we recently watched, um, like, a PBS documentary on cancer called The King of All Maladies. And they essentially talk about how cancer is so, quote, popular, where there's so much money going to cancer now because people champion this through political channels. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and that's how everyone wants to fight cancer because essentially it, was, it got, it went through like this big marketing push, I guess, where like everyone knew of this being a real problem so let's put a lot of money to it and every year they've been putting in more money whereas something like phage and antibiotic resistance it doesn't have that same like visceral emotional punch mm-hmm. yet there's not mm-hmm. been a single movement i mean there is carbex and other things like that but it's more like a scientific movement rather than like an emotional uh, movement for the public right so, like, until we have that, antibiotic resistance isn't going to be as big as cancer. And you probably heard about Stephanie Strathy and Tom Patterson's uh, phage therapy case that they were... Did you hear about that um, in San Diego? I don't think so. So this is something that is really pushing public awareness of phage, and it's... Um, so Stephanie, she just, they finished writing their book and it was just published. It's called The Perfect Predator and I'm in the middle of it right now. Um, and what happened was uh, Tom, Stephanie's husband, he got sick in Egypt with an infection. Yeah, yeah. she and, has a TED talk, right? Yes. Yeah. And so she managed to round up a bunch of phage researchers by email and convince them to make phages for her husband. And then he got the treatment and I mean, that's a... a Large oversimplification of it, but um, but yeah, they were out of options. His acinetobacter was totally drug resistant. They were just keeping him alive on life support for, you know, months. So um, it ended up being something that the doctors wanted to try, and um, and they tried it, and so that's gotten because it worked, and he recovered, and so and nothing else was helping him, and. Um, and then, so that's a bit of a heart wrenching story, but it was a good ending. And then there was Mallory Smith who got a lot of publicity. She's a 25 year old girl, um, who has cystic fibrosis. And in 2017, she died because they couldn't get, um, her infection under control, her lung infection. And they tried to use phage therapy and it, it came too late. So they, they got the initial phages they administered to her and they could actually in an autopsy apparently detect that the phages had gotten to the site of the lung and like had started to multiply. So they were eating the bacteria that the antibiotics couldn't touch, but it's a lack of infrastructure and, you know, knowledge um, of anyone who would have been treating her. I mean, about phages and, um, and, and it was driven by the family members really. And so, that's a heart-wrenching story that did not end well and i think more and more of these are going to get the public interested in seeing that this is worth looking at Uh, are there other uses for phage therapy yeah phages anywhere you have a bacterial problem that's the other really cool thing that we are exploring with phage directory too is supporting communities working with phages in other ways like agriculture um, and veterinary medicine too and water treatment, like um, crops. So you can really use phages in place of antibiotics um, in theory. Mm-hmm. And it may be better. We want to stop feeding our animals antibiotics. Right. Um, and so using phages is a way of substituting if, if you can show that they have a good effect. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then water filtration doesn't work. 
um, that, that well because it doesn't it, what, it doesn't catch a lot of um, bacteria, is it? Or? Yeah, and I don't know a lot about water filtration yet or like what that industry, that's kind of on our list of mm-hmm. industries to explore and start talking to people within them. But, um, but there's, there's that possibility, really. Mm-hmm. If you can culture an organism... You can find phages against it, and then you can explore how to use them. And there, so there's phage products on the market. I always forget to mention this. Um, there are phage products on the market in the U.S., but they're for food. So you can spray phages onto your prepackaged meat, like ready-to-eat meat. So there's a listeria spray, anti-listeria spray, and then there's an E. coli one, and there's a probably there's at least one more. And that's Intralytics, is a company that kind of started there. And now they're getting into human phage therapy. So they're treating, they're doing a clinical trial right now for um, IBD, which is really interesting. We didn't touch on that, but phages aren't always, even within the, the therapy umbrella, um, we, we, all we've talked about so far has been like acute infectious disease. Mm-hmm. But there's also non-infectious disease that you could use phages for. Like IBD, they don't really know the cause, but they think it might be certain kind of bacteria are out of balance. So if you can find, like, who's not supposed to be here in the gut microbiome right. and delete those ones only, mm-hmm. then you can really help, potentially. So there's this whole field now blossoming um, of you of looking at the microbiome, finding out something that, some specific bacterial species that we want to have less of, and then using phages to get rid of those. Um, so, yeah, there's anything you can think of, really. Yeah. So remind me, how long the FH directory has been around? How long have you guys been doing this? Since um, November 2017. 2017. So, like so it's just new. over a yeah. year now, I guess. And um, is it just yeah. the two of you running it so far? Yeah. Yep. Okay. What are the um, plans for the future? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Yeah. Um, so we have lots of plans. And we are, so we started, we didn't really get into this, but the reason we started Phage Directory was to help Mallory, the girl with um, cystic fibrosis who needed phages. We started just in that sector where we're going to have a list of all the people working on phages in the world who might want to contribute phages for a future human um, compassionate use case. Mm-hmm. And um, we started with that vision, and then now we've been expanding to be a support for anyone working with phages. And um, we want to facilitate communication between those people. And one way to do that is by publishing phage data on our site and allowing people, because, and and findings, not just your traditional journal articles, but smaller findings like, you know, I tried this and it did not work for this phage. And here's the data. There's there's, um, a lot of insights that people don't have because of the traditional way that publishing works. You have to have this novel study that is, it must be the first time it's done and it must be, you know, impactful in a way that um, repeating, doing something like they call them Me Too papers, <laughs> doing something similar that someone else did, but just another organism is kind of like not a very, it's not as cool of a paper. And so there's all these, this incentive structure that kind of goes against what we think is important which is all this insight, every piece of insight should be searchable and should be there and open for people to read. And um, you should be able to, you know, as a physician or as a somebody who's outside, maybe academia, go in and say, okay, which organism am I treating? What's, what's been done with that organism with phages? And, um, you know, I want to know if somebody used this and it didn't work. I want to know if it worked in a mouse. I want to know if somebody tried it in a mouse, but it failed. And that's not something you can readily access right now. So we want to become this central place for the phage, anyone working with phage, to come to get educated on what they need to know, get the protocols they need to be able to, you know, do phage research. Like, how much of this should I add? Or, like, what's a good strategy of purifying this phage? Or, like, medical protocols. Like, we dose this person for every you know, 12 hours for five days, like case reports like that. And there's, there's a lot out there, but, um, it's not very easy to interact with. Right. Yeah. And we've been talking about mostly Western science right now. Yeah. And antibiotic resistance is 
like in the West is actually the it's not that much of a problem. But you know, in like in Asia and India and a lot of other like those other countries, like it's a massive, massive problem. It's just gonna get worse. Mm. So one of our things is we want to get into making science open. We like we want to get into open access and publishing and so on, mainly uh, as a way to get the science to their labs, right? Because right now they have to spend so much money trying to just read the scientific literature and stay on top yeah. of it. So much money and they, no one can really afford it, not even Western no, yeah. universities now. So, so. And so we want to give them a place where they can actually access everything and also submit their research into this pool of information. Because we think, at least I think, that they probably have some very unique insights from working in those conditions from you know having less funding and so on they have to innovate in certain ways that we just don't need to think about right because everything is so readily available here so having their perspective i think is really necessary for this to go forward yeah it should not cost uh money or very much money to be able to know what's been done um just in a given field. Most of this stuff is publicly funded research. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's a huge movement of itself, but we're really passionate about like about the movement itself, but also we wanna in the at the same time focus on this phage community, at least first. Mm-hmm. But uh, the two, you know, phage the phage community has the same problem that is had by all these other kind of communities. We recognize that for sure. But there's it just feels like such a good time for, for fade appreciation of phage and for we, we see a lot of like you see if you talk to phage people who've been in the field for a long time they'll they see waves of like up and down up and down like people like phages no we don't like phages anymore there's a lot of companies a lot of investment oh that didn't work out so so we don't want this to be another like an example of a little hype bubble yeah. we want to support it hold it up and sustain it and there's a lot of enthusiasm building right now and i hope i don't think it's gonna die like it has in the past and that's because of what we know about genetics and the microbiome now like you can't go back to a point where we didn't know there was a microbiome we didn't know there's phages all over inside our bodies like that used to not be known very recently has that been known so it's yeah we we want to support the community but it's not like this community is completely unique in its issues. It's mm-hmm. really like what we learn from this, I think can probably be applied to a lot of fields of science. It's all part of a larger movement. How can people find out more about getting involved? Um, we have, we're on Twitter at phage directory, just spelled as it sounds, assuming phage sounds like it's spelled P H A G phage directory. And then we are, we have a website called phage dot directory. Not .com, but .directory. And, yeah, well, um, phagedirectory.org or phagedirectory.com actually points to the site, Perfect. Too, so. See, Jan has thought of all the possibilities. <laughs> um, and we have a newsletter. This is, our, this is the best way to keep track of what the, what's happening in the phage community. We are collecting news articles and press releases from phage companies. Um, we're collecting everything we can each week and we put out a micro periodical or newsletter blog called Capsid and Tail. Capsid being the head of the phage <laughs> and Tail is the tail and so you can subscribe to that and keep up to date and we just started having guest writers on the platform so now we're in our 23rd week of running it. Okay. So um, yeah. Didn't get a read. Uh, I get, didn't get a chance to read the most, or really any of the articles on it. But I saw the most recent article on the newsletter was um, about using it, um, using phage therapy with a pregnant. Or yeah, pregnancy. yeah. That was our guest writer, Lucy Ferfaro. Um, she's from University of Western Australia, mm-hmm. and she studies the perinatal uh, phageome, I believe. So the phages that and perinatal is. Uh, related to time, I guess, time right before and after childbirth. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, I mean, I I don't know a lot about this subject, but she introduced that there's actually uh, a need for studying whether phages might be appropriate to treat populations like this. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, pregnant women or women right after they've given birth. Um, and I've been learning more about this lately that apparently pregnancy is something really understudied. And a lot of the reason is because uh, for a long time it's been thought, you know, this is a vulnerable population mm -hmm. and you can't really put those people in clinical trials. That's not ethical. But then it ends up being that um, the drugs out there haven't been tested on pregnant yeah. women because <laughs> they're not allowed in the trials. Right. So I don't know how widespread this is, but um, it's really interesting to think about phages because a lot of people first pass would be like, no, don't use untested things like, you know. Don't don't use something you don't really know works in a vulnerable population, but actually they're very vulnerable and antibiotics are like not a picnic. They mm -hmm. destroy your microbiome. So it's very cool to start thinking like maybe the phages could be something really for this population. Yeah, it seems like with that particular issue, people can't think long term. You know, they're just like, oh, we can't put this this individual in that situation, but they can't think about the actual numbers, the people that are going to suffer from not having these treatments. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's a fascinating area. Yeah, it really is. We're learning a lot with this. Right, having to write an article every week really makes mm. you kind of start reading more broadly. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and and what kind of uh, what kind of help are you guys looking for specifically right now? Well, actually, what we really want to get into is getting more doctors uh, to talk to us because that's because we're so connected in the science world, we haven't had a lot of time to explore the, the doctor area. So we would love to hear from uh, doctors in infectious disease, from, from I guess, labs inside of Yeah, clini clinical researchers. Uh, really, any, anyone from the medical side of things, they yeah. don't have to be doctors, like nurses, nurses that yeah. mm -hmm. you know deal with patients with superbug infections or who are concerned or even just to have their perspective on how we need to know more about how the medical field works and like day-to-day mm -hmm. -day works, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like what, what are the things that doctors really care about and what they mm -hmm. want to know? Where do they learn about new advances? Like yeah. where, which conferences should we be trying to attend to get to open-minded people who are, um, who have the patients that actually could benefit from phages. Even if we would love to hear from people who absolutely don't think that this is good at all, like yeah. that we just haven't been able to, and we haven't focused enough on this yet, um, but we haven't been able to find enough um, infectious disease mm -hmm. medical people mm -hmm. to really feel satisfied that we understand the problem from their yeah, perspective exactly. yet. So we, we talked to one group of doctors and they mentioned about uh, hospital organisms, like bacteria that just stay in the hospitals and how they're trying to understand, you know, what organisms are becoming resident, like resistant in the hospitals and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And phages could potentially be a way to, you know, to clear the hospitals of these. Yeah, things. using phages on inert surfaces mm -hmm. to actually disinfect. That's another thing we didn't mention. Yeah, medical that's interesting. Devices, yeah. yeah, medical devices. Um, yeah, like hip replacement joints and things mm -hmm. like that. And but yeah, actually devices themselves. Um, and there's so much, you know, epidemiology research that probably knows a lot about which strains are where. And we've been hearing that a little bit too, that certain hospitals, they actually know which strains of each pathogen are really living in this hospital. And mm -hmm. so they can predict which strains are that patients are going to get. Um, so it would be so cool to eventually have a system where like there were phages on hand that could kill those yeah. strains, right? You wouldn't necessarily need hundreds and hundreds of phages. Mm -hmm. Um, and even as a last resort, like even if it's before FDA approves phages through the traditional route, uh, making people aware that, you know, you give us a strain, we can find a phage, not we, but our community, um, will mobilize and find a phage and, there's ways to solve these problems. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, I will put a link to the Twitter account um, yep. uh, and, and the newsletter and all that. Great. And um, yeah, we're going to try to get some. Uh, I, I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. Thank so you. So I, I hope people will uh, check you out and look into it. It's, yeah. It's so important. Thank you so much for having us on here. This is the first time we've been on a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot more to come. Ooh, <laughs> exciting. All right, well, thank you guys. Thank so you so much. Much.